My name is Maika. I am based with the Center for Sustainability Transitions in South Africa. Um, I am a little bit um, embarrassed, but my favorite podcasts are usually like murder mystery podcasts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the, the big um, niche podcasts, like, and they, I mean, there's a lot of them and they have quite a following, um, I think some of them. Um, but so I'm not so um, on top of kind of podcasts that are actually in my field. I've yet to kind of explore into that because I've until recently I've seen podcasting more as like a something to to kind of do something completely different, not work related. You know, like something something like a, a distraction. Um, but I I've been involved in um, putting together an episode for a podcast called Future Cities which is, um, uh, I think, one that's ma mainly based uh, in the U.S. and sort of talks about um, urban planning and sort of green infrastructure, et cetera, in the U.S. And so I've just had a little peek behind the sort of the curtains of how it's done, um, but it really interested and um, keen to hear more. So thanks. That's great. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a lot of scope to be creative with podcasting and taking uh, influences from other sorts of styles of podcasting and, and dropping little bits in into uh, to, to liven things up uh, as well. So, you know, I think uh, interesting stuff. So um, another question then would be, uh, what time of day do you prefer to listen to podcasts? Do you find it on the commute on the way in, in the evening when you're relaxing? lunchtime I think it's mainly on the when when I'm commuting um mm -hmm. which hasn't been so much recently um <laughs> working from home but yeah it can be um but usually I think uh also in the sort of mornings when I get ready like just to have something in the background Right, right, right. Well, that leads on to my last question to start with, which is how long would you listen for? So do you have a, an optimum length for podcasts? You know? Yeah, that's a good question, because sometimes I think like, oh, a 20 minute episode is just perfect. And then I'm like, well, but that wasn't quite enough. So now what do I do? Do I start? A <laughs> but um, I think generally the ones that I listen to are between half an hour and an hour, roughly. Right, right, right. That's interesting. And uh, how about yourself, Sakib? Hi, everybody. So uh, my name is Saqib Huck. I'm at the base of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Dhaka, Bangladesh. So um, in terms of favorite post podcasts, I, I did have a sort of series that I used to follow from um, Professor Brian Cox. They had quite a good series, I think, produced for that. Um, they were usually about somewhere between uh, 25 minutes to about 45 minutes, I think, per podcast, which... Uh, back when I was commuting was a, was a perfect time because it would just be the nice bit of time fill for something. But now that in the last year or so, my commute is, doesn't exist. It's more about listening to things maybe when I'm doing chores or so. So maybe I'm, I'd be like doing dishes or like cleaning up my room or doing laundry or anything. And that, that sort of time frame is usually how much I have that I can just stick some headphones on and listen to something. So I think that that's become the time now. But Again, I, I'm not opposed to doing uh, longer ones, but I think um, for entertainment purposes, I would probably do these 25 minute or half hour ones for just general interest. But I have done longer ones, which were more work related. So I know I, WRI have a sort of longer, I think it's about an hour, almost a two hour session of podcasts that they have. And um, again, from time to time, those are some things that we do use for work. So then, then it's more like sort of um, listening to a class. So I'll, I'll sit with that. That'll be probably one of the core tasks that I'm doing. And I'll be taking notes of the things that I'm listening to. So again, depending on the intention, I probably could do a longer one, but I, I wouldn't recommend it very often. But yeah, that's, that, that's great. Now, these are all questions that might influence the, um, uh, or inform the style and content of your own podcast going forward, thinking about, you know, trying to think about, put yourself in the audience shoes and uh, particularly in terms of the time that uh, the length of the, of the podcast you yeah. so um, in this session uh, there's sort of three areas to cover um, planning roles and responsibilities which is for IID's experience the most important part and if you spend more time on the planning um, then you end up with a much better product and uh, everybody knows 
what their roles and responsibilities are. Uh, and then we'll do a little bit of recording and editing. Uh, that's not, can't really do a training session as such, but just to give you a, a little bit of an insight into some of the tools that, that we use, a little bit of a demonstration of those uh, to, to, to show you how they work. And then finally, a little bit on another key factor is marketing and promotion. Obviously, you, you want the maximum amount of people to enjoy your podcast uh, when it's finally released. So let's kick off with uh, planning roles and responsibilities. Uh, working on two screens here. So I'll just move that up there. And yes, so producing a podcast for the IAD team, uh, we involve a number of uh, roles in this, and quite often one individual will take on more than one of these roles. Uh, but typically they would include the concept originator who's thought up the idea for the podcast, uh, the producer who will oversee the whole process, the host, which may indeed be the concept originator or the producer, or it could be somebody else altogether, uh, administrative support, uh, the unsung heroes of the project who help arrange all the uh, associated meetings and sessions, uh, a recording supervisor, somebody who's actually going to manage the recording session uh, and then an audio editor which is often the same person as the recording supervisor but it can be split up and it's useful to think of these as, as different roles because they're all different areas that need to be thought about uh, marketing support that's always very important at the end we say we want to make sure the maximum amount of people enjoy our product at the end and of course the guests themselves which we mustn't forget about they're very important indeed so our concept originator, uh, they'll be the person who's already come up with the initial idea for the podcast, uh, and they will work closely and share some responsibilities with the producer and may in fact double up and take on that role and or other roles as well. Then there is the producer themselves. So their role is to coordinate the whole project, working with all the other roles, uh, they'll help fine tune the original concept and any questions or issues that are going to be raised and ideally prepare a, an initial brief uh, for prospective guests when you invite them to say the sorts of things that you're going to want them to, to speak about. Um, and they'll also work with the concept originator to actually contact those guests and, uh, and see if they're available and want to join. Once the participants uh, have been finalised, uh, they will then prepare and share a running order document detailing who the participants are, uh, what questions are likely to be asked, and in what order the participants will be called on, etc. Uh, and then they'll arrange a meeting with all the participants before the actual recording session if possible to discuss and agree and amend the running order document and uh, make notes on prospective answers because uh, what you don't want is for two people to intuitively want to answer a question in exactly the same way. So if you have some idea of how people are going to respond beforehand, you can tailor the question to a different participant in a slightly different way and that sort of thing. And uh, when the recording's been completed and the initial edits been made, uh, the producer will arrange for a transcript of that, of what was said, and then supervise the final editing and marketing processes. Your host, Another key role, uh, maybe the concept originator often is someone who can draw on their direct experience of the subject matter, but it may be a, an independent expert communicator who's used to presenting and facilitating discussions and has been briefed on the topic in hand. So with IID on our Make Change Happen podcast, for example, our director of comms, uh, Liz Carlisle, is the regular host uh, because she's very good at hosting. And, um, and yeah, she'll have a meeting with the concepts originators and stuff and, and make sure she's fully briefed on the topic and they've discussed the questions that they want to get answers to. So then you have your recording supervisor and that's a, 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 a basic technical role. So if you're recording online, which is the easiest way to do it, and we'll come to a bit more detail about that, they just need to be familiar with the chosen recording platform and ahead of the session, they should arrange separate 
connectivity tests to the platform with each pa uh, participant. So that will minimize any technical issues on the day uh, and also ensure that the link for joining the actual recording session has, has been shared in, in good time ahead of the uh, event. And on the day of the session, they'll manage the actual recording itself. They'll be pressing record and pause and asking for retakes if something isn't clear. And after the recording's finished, they'll download the individual audio files for each participant uh, in preparation for editing and mixing. Um, and in the event that a participant is unable to make the scheduled session, sometimes the recording supervisor will arrange a separate session with just the participant and the host, and they'll edit that little bit of audio into the final recording later. And then the audio editor. Uh, this is a little bit of a daunting task because you do need a little bit of specialist knowledge for it, um, but it can also be outsourced. Um, there are a lot of a lot, a lot of us are, are keen audio and video hobbyists these days, so it's, it's it's not too daunting. It's not as daunting as that little animation would show uh, these days. So um, their first job is going to be to prepare a, a rough mix for the uh, producer to. Um, to look at, and they'll just to do that, they'll just remove any obvious mistakes or retakes or excessive pauses and stuff. And they'll do that by importing the individual audio files into an audio editing app. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in detail further on. And uh, once again, if, if one or more of the participants have pre recorded their session or done a separate recording session, this is the point the audio editor will roughly put that in its correct place in the larger recording. And so when the producer has had a listen to that first edit and decided on any further changes, the editor that can then produce a final edit, uh, which can optionally include any pre-agreed theme music or musical stings or sound effects to break up the dialogue as appropriate, for example, between questions to participants. And when the final edit has been approved, the audio editor is responsible for uploading it to a podcast hosting platform, such as SoundCloud, for example. We'll talk a little bit more about those as we go ahead as well. And then marketing support, very key area. So once the podcast is ready, they all liaise with the web and or communications team in your organization, or they may indeed be the web or communications team, uh, and they'll ensure the podcast is available on the main website and also promote it via social media or mailing lists, for example. Admin support, another key area, will just support the producer in contacting participants, arranging meetings, advising participants of recording dates, arranging for transcription, and any other support tasks that's, that are delegated to them. Guests, now this is obviously a very key area. So one thing is to think carefully about the number of guests that, that you will invite. Um, the more guests that you have, the less time each will have to speak, depending on your planned length of podcasts. So at IID, we aim for around 35 minutes, and um, we found that three guests and a host, on, which is like four tracks of audio, to mix a 35-minute podcast with that many participants can take up to a full day quite easily. And so when you add more participants to that, you, you increase the editing time exponentially because there's another audio track to go through and you know mute when they're coughing or chop out any bits that uh, shouldn't be there and all those sorts of uh, little post-production tasks. So um, while it's quite nice to be ambitious, uh, it's also you know, nice to sort of work within the constraints of what you know uh, is, is possible. The other thing is try to encourage your guests to have a dialogue with each other uh, rather than just answer your questions or as well as just answer your questions. And um, in our experience, having say three or at the most four questions uh, amongst two or three other participants with maybe a summary question at the end allows enough time for a little bit of natural interaction between the guests, you know, where they have time to respond to each other's response to questions and things like that. So, uh, yeah, keeping the guest numbers manageable is very important. So that's our first section on planning 
and roles and responsibilities. Any questions on, on, uh, on that so far? I actually have a question um, at, at the IIED. Do you have, uh, so how, do, how does it normally work? Do you normally have a person, a separate person for each of these roles? Or is it normally that, for example, the producer and the concept um, originator are the same person? Or how do you run it? Uh, let me just go back to my list of roles on my other screen. And it's, well, we're quite lucky that we have quite a large comms department here. Mm -hmm. So our, co our concept originator is normally one of the researchers here. Right. So research focus. Uh, then uh, a member of the comms team will take on the role of producer. I see. Uh, and as I say, for our standard Make Change Happen, podcast which is our series of institutional podcasts our director of communications is always the host for that okay. although we've recently done a, a little mini series of podcasts with the climate change team on um, loss and damage and they the uh, in each case there the, the originator of the idea hosted the session themselves oh, okay. so that would be uh, Aditya and Marek uh, you may have come across them um, right. working with them as well um, admin support we're quite lucky that we do have uh, a, a group administrator who can uh, who can delegate a lot of those sorts of tasks too so that's normally a separate role uh, the recording supervisor and audio editor is usually the same person here at IAD very often me or one of my colleagues in the comms team um, and marketing support comes from the wider comms team as well okay. uh, because we have a uh, an audience development manager and a publications and marketing manager with okay. So our comms team is quite large. Um, but yeah, so so certainly there's eight roles there, well, seven roles, not counting guests. So they would probably at IID be split between say four members of staff. Right, but okay. It, it isn't uncommon in producing uh, you know, podcasts for more of those roles to be taken by one person but of right. course then it takes up more of their time basically yeah. as a resource so that, that's the the downside of that right yeah it's interesting because i think the one podcast that i've been sort of very marginally involved in there was it's mostly like there's like seven roles and there's maybe two people <laughs> right so they, you right. know so they do a lot of, of, of each of these things. So that's interesting to hear, thanks. Right, right, right. I just think it's still useful to think in terms of those roles though, because they're all different aspects of production yeah. that need to be considered. And, and are quite often, you know, some of them are skipped, like some people put a lot of effort into the actual recording, but right. um, not into the marketing afterwards, which, mm -hmm. which then means that, uh, you know, you've got a great product, but not enough people have heard it at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay. So, so I just had a question on the, the editor's uh, roles and tasks. So um, do you guys use more sort of the in-house um, editing tools and softwares or do the podcasting platforms have that built into it and you're just you upload it there and do the, the hard editing on that before publishing? Excellent, excellent question, which I am going to cover in detail in this coming up session uh, section um, on, on um, editing options and, and also the, the costs of different different methods of production there as well. Um, so, so yeah, um, there are some free options for recording and editing. Uh, in particular, you can, some people would use Skype to actually record a, a podcast. That's the simplest method to record a podcast, perhaps, uh, to use Skype or, or Zoom um, or any other preferred video messaging or, or, or video uh, messaging or video conferencing app um, that has a built-in record function. So, and of course, they offer free versions. They're easy to use and they can be quite effective for a single host, single guest setup. Um, there are a number of potential issues to consider with more than that um, uh, and how important those issues are depends on the type of podcast that you're aiming to produce and the production values that, uh, you know, in terms of sound quality, music and sound effects and all that that you aspire to. So one issue with messaging and video conferencing app is they'll record all of your audio on just one track which makes it harder to balance the audio levels between guests if one is louder than the other and that sort of thing. And it won't be possible to clean up audio where you and your guests speak over each other at the same time or something like that. You, know, you can chop that bit out, but you can't 
you know, edit it and separate it out again. Um, and the quality of the audio that you record using that method will depend on the quality of your call uh, because it's all recorded in the cloud. And um, if you end up with, with a poor quality recording, there's very limited scope for um, improving it in, in post-production. So uh, those are a couple of the most basic um, options. Then there is another uh, option called Zencaster. There are a number of online podcast uh, recording options that are springing up. But at IID, we used Zencaster. We do use Zencaster, rather. Um, and they offer a free hobbyist account, which supports one host and up to four guests. So that's actually quite a good um, service. And we'll talk a little bit more about Zencaster in detail, because I'd say that's the one we use at IID shortly. Uh, they also offer a, a paid pro account uh, with a few more features. Uh, so for editing, there are a couple of free options. Uh, Audacity, which is uh, a, 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 an open source audio editor program that works on a PC and a Mac. Uh, the pros of that are that it's got many useful preset audio effects and it does have multi-track capability, so you can if you do have a multi-track recording, you can edit it in there. Uh, the cons are a particular application, although it's probably the best of the free ones available for the PC, it does have a steep learning curve. Um, and it doesn't have sort of built-in add-ons that you get with some other programs like um, free music loops or sound effects. Uh, the other key free uh, recording software is GarageBand, which unfortunately only works on a Mac. But if you are lucky enough to have a Mac, it is a fantastic program. Uh, it's very, very fully featured with many um, functions that you normally find in much higher end apps. Uh, and it has built in music loops and sound effect libraries. And really the only con for it is that it's Mac only. Um, so obviously not available to, to PC users. So those are some free options. But on the paid for front, there is this tool Zencaster, which we are very fond of at IIED. Um, Zencaster is a cloud-based recording app. What it does is it records each participant on a separate audio track that you can download and mix afterwards. Uh, it records that, it does that by recording a high quality audio track for each participant on their own PC during the session. And it uploads that at the end of the session. However, it also records simultaneously a lower quality audio direct to the cloud. So if something goes wrong with the locally stored audio, you have a, a backup that's lower quality, but still generally usable quality. We've, we've had to resort to that a couple of times where things have gone wrong at IAD. Uh, and they do offer this free hobbyist account for up to four guests and a host, uh, but they also have a pro account with um, more features available. Um, as I say, there are other apps like this out there. There's um, Squadcast and Ringer, um, and there'll be links to those in the presentation that I'll share with you later. But they all work in a similar way. So today we're just having a closer look at Zencaster. Uh, many of these apps are also beginning to offer video as well as audio recording. But for today, we're only looking at audio recording. So on with the next slide. So just a few hardware and software requirements for Zencaster. Uh, these would be similar for other apps. So just a modern operating system, Windows 10 or Mac OS 10.14, or even Linux, if you are very techy. Uh, if you're recording audio, only four gig of RAM on your machine is good enough. Uh, although we're not talking about video today, but if you did want to record video, they recommend eight gig of RAM for that. Web browsers, one constraint with Zencaster in particular at the moment is that it will only work with these three browsers. In fact, they've only just added Microsoft Edge to those um, supported browsers, but most of us would have Chrome or Edge on our machine, and some of us might have Brave as well. Uh, you need a fairly decent internet connection, five megabits per second or more, and there's a link in the presentation where you can check your uh, internet speed. Yeah. Uh, for hard disk uh, space, for recording audio only, 
having two gigabytes spare is good. If you're recording video as well, 10 gigabytes is necessary. But as I say, we're not going to talk very much about video, but I just want to include that for completion. Headphones are really, really useful during the recording. They prevent echo and feedback. Um, without them, your sound coming through somebody else's speakers can then be re-recorded and sent back to you. So you get this echo effect. So headphones are very good. If possible, an external mic or an audio headset uh, is also even better. Uh, main reason for that is a headset mic will keep your mic at the same position. So if you turn away to look at another screen or look down to uh, rustle some papers or something, um, your voice doesn't suddenly drop off the way mine would today because I haven't put my headset on. Uh, and the last thing you'll need, of course, is a uh, account with Zencaster. And you can just go to their website and sign up for a free account, a free hobbyist account. So talking about uh, Zencaster, uh, creating an episode is very easy. Uh, I'll just This is a little video clip. So you just sign into your Zencaster account and from the dashboard, you click create episode, type a name for your episode, uh, and then select the recording mode. Uh, you've got choice of audio and video or just audio only here and click create. And then you're immediately taken to your appropriate recording page. And on this page at the very top in the uh, URL address bar, you'll see the address that you can share with people to join this podcast or invite them to them. So a little bit more about inviting guests. Uh, oops, that seems to be the same slide. Oh, there we are. That's technology. Inviting guests, there we are. So inviting guests from the uh, recording page, you can simply click on invite and then type the name and email of each guest you want to invite. Uh, click send invites and an email will be sent to each guest with the link. However, Zencaster doesn't include a calendar for scheduling. So you will need to follow up with a separate email or calendar invite that includes the date and time of the recording. Or my super option is to just copy the invite link uh, episode URL and send it to a guest in your own email or calendar invite, uh, including a link to Zencaster's information for guests, which is this Google Doc here. Uh, there's a link to that in the presentation. Or you can attach a document with your own more specific instructions. That's appropriate. Uh, starting the recording session, once you've signed in at the scheduled recording time, or ideally a little before, uh, from the dashboard, you select your episode and you go to the recording page. And as you can see on this page, you can see at the moment, we're waiting for everyone to join the room. And once the guest has fully joined the session, there we are, you see that changes to a start recording option at the start. And we can see that here we have IID comms, who is the host, and someone called David, who's joined as a guest. Guests join by clicking the link that they were sent. Uh, in, a, in an invite and just so you can see what a guest screen would look like. Um, they will follow the link and just so paste into the bar there. And here we are. They have some options to change their default mic or speaker setup and just type in their name. And then from their aspect, you will see that you'll be asked to uh, allow audio playback. And then you can see that they see a very similar screen to the host only without the recording controls once they've joined the meeting. So once everyone's joined and before the recording starts, the recording supervisor just check the settings, make sure everyone can hear each other, um, ask participants to adjust their mic position or shut out any excessive background noise or any such thing. Uh, the host and the guests each control their own audio settings. So to change any settings, you click on the settings uh, option there, just seeing, and guests see a slightly shorter uh, list of options. So moving on. Oops, to Daisy. Yeah. We're in the session as a guest. We've joined the session as a guest. We've checked our settings. What can we do next? What can we do next? We can move on to the next slide. Starting the recording, that's what we wanted to see. So once everyone's there and you're ready, you see this big start recording button at the top, 
click that, you get a three second countdown, and then the recording starts. And so you can see there, uh, you can see the um, audio wave of uh, the speaker moving on there. You can pause recording if you need to give an instruction to a guest. You can see the timer stops even though the timeline continues to run, and then you can just resume recording again. So if someone needs to step away or you need to give an instruction to a guest or anything, you can simply uh, pause and resume when appropriate. So ending the recording, uh, unsurprisingly, to end the recording, once you've resumed it, you would click on the stop button. Uh, and at that point, you and each guest should see a pop-up saying that you have success in uploading the file from your local machine. So here we go, we just hold on there, you see, there we are. I got a little pop-up there that says success. All of your tracks have finalized and uploaded. Now, uh, if anybody closes the uh, Zencaster tab or their web browser or their computer before seeing the success pop-up, uh, then it will interrupt their file, their local file uploading. And so you possibly won't be able to download it and will have to use the cloud version of the file instead. Um, guest sees a slightly different view there. Once again, once their files are uploaded, as a guest, they see this big um, notice saying that their files have uploaded uh, and, and an ad for them to join Zencast themselves and start podcasting. But if they click no thanks, they'll simply get back into the session. Once you've ended the recording and your guests have left, you're ready to download your files. And as you can see here, hang up the call to end the uh, session completely. Your guest is now offline. And here you can see there's an option to download your audio file in MP3 format. If you have the pro account, you can also download in WAV format, which is our higher quality uncompressed audio. But for most podcasts, I would suggest MP3s are adequate. So I'm now going to whiz through a very quick look at editing a podcast using a tool called GarageBand. Uh, I'm going to use this one because it has the easiest interface of all. Uh, Zencaster Pro does have some basic automatic post-production tools, but they're really most useful if your um, session has produced a, a pretty good recording already. Uh, it will attempt to balance the levels of each participant uh, and add some audio compression to smooth out peaks or quieter parts, but it won't mute background noise on individual tracks. And once again, it will output all of the audio in a single file. So you're making it harder to make uh, small cuts and edits um, after you've got that. So for most professional sounding results, using a multi-track audio editor is recommended. Uh, some popular audio editing apps are Adobe Audition for PC or Mac. That's a paid for subscription uh, program. Hindenburg Journalist, uh, for PC or Mac, uh, GarageBand, which is Mac only, uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, Audacity, which is PC or Mac as well, but, uh, uh, and it's free. The free ones, as I say, have uh, fewer features, less support, which can be key, uh, and a steeper learning curve. So uh, at IID, we use Baby Audition or GarageBand, um, but other factors such as, you know, obviously your budget or software that you're already familiar with, um, can also be key factors to consider. So with your audio editor, first job being to prepare a first mix for the producer, uh, one of the first things they'll do is import the audio from the files, the separate audio files and, and pop those in. So we're looking at GarageBand here, and here I am opening the downloads folder. Here are the files I downloaded earlier. I simply drag them onto the timeline. And as you can see, they're both exactly the same length. So if I line them up perfectly, then they'll play together in perfect sync. Uh, there's one file for each participant, which is really useful when we come to balance them. So I've just pressed play and you can probably hear There I am being very quiet as the host. So we'll have to fix that. 
So here we are, you can see relative to each other, those tracks, one is much louder than the other. Uh, and also one of them has quite a lot of pauses in. So we're going to do some quick edits on that. Just bear with me a second as we get to the So there we are, that's that. So first thing we'll do is cut out some of the big silences. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about exactly the uh, commands to do this. It's more to show you what it looks like uh, being done and how visually you can edit songs. Most of these uh, apps, let's say, work in a similar way. You can select, you can cut, you can delete, you can, copy sections and make them reappear further on in the uh, recording and all of those things. So as you can see, what I'm doing here is taking out uh, some longish pauses and silences, which will make the overall length of the uh, finalized thing much more uh, short and concise. So I think I've got one more to take out there, which we'll just do very quickly, very quickly. Even quicker than that. And they're gone. So now I can just drag these parts all closer together to remove those gaps altogether. Very simple. And the audio will now sound a lot more natural without the big pauses between myself. Once again, we're still very quiet here. Fix that in a second. <laughs> so now we'll just adjust. Uh, what are we going to do next? We're going to possibly add a little effect to these uh, vocals to make them sound a little bit crisper. Now, as I say, most of these programs have some built-in audio effects that are very useful. Uh, GarageBand has one in particular called Narration Vocal, which adds a little bit of compression to the uh, vocal and just smooths it out and makes it a little bit brighter. So I normally use that uh, as a default just to improve the sound of the vocals. You can't hear it so much on that particular track. Although what you can hear is adding compression actually boosts the volume of the track. So that's why I did that before balancing the audio together. So now I can turn that person down Maybe. and just turn this person up a bit. Yeah. And sorry, I'm going to pause there, sorry, to answer your question. No, I was just wondering if it's just me, but I can't yes. actually hear anything when you're playing. It. Micah, you're right, yes. I was okay. just about to say that, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm not, oh. getting, not getting any sound, David. <laughs> any sound at all? No, sorry. That. I thought maybe it was just me. No, me. no, no, do shout up. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, well, luckily that section was quite visual, but uh, what I'll do is I'll quickly stop sharing and then I shall reshare again, making sure I'm sharing sound this time. Uh, hopefully, is that working? Uh, that's not because I have a connected screen. There we are. Right, sorry, I shall try that again from here. Interesting. Yay! Okay. It's <laughs> certainly been my pleasure. Uh, <laughs> so what I've done there is just balanced Hello, the sound and welcome to added a couple of effects. Um, I won't go through that my guest, again. David, who promises to be very interesting as he tells us all about his work. David, would you like to introduce yourself to us? That's great, thanks. Yes, I'm David, and I'm very excited to be here to tell you all about my exciting work. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, so there, I think I've more or less finished editing that. Oh no, I know what else I'm going to do to that. Just to demonstrate that this is possible. Um, as I say, some of these uh, programs come with uh, extra features such as music loops and sound effects. And so now that I'm happy with the balanced vocals, I will pop over here and look in their music library and pick out an appropriate, there we are, that sounds quite podcasty. I'll just pop that over there. Uh, as you can see, it's quite short. So what I'll do is I'll just copy it and then paste it again afterwards a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, and then if we just come back to the beginning, that's it for too long, come back to the beginning and play from there. So we can see that's much too loud. Easy to balance. He promises to be very interesting as he tells us all about his work. David, would you like to introduce yourself? So there we are, uh, a basically edited small piece of audio, and you can see that's the sort of thing that we would do to uh, with a longer piece to make a, a, a professional sounding podcast. So that's our recording section. Uh, as I said, I couldn't really go into it as a training section as such, but just, just to give you an overview of the sorts of tools that, uh, that are popular to use uh, and how easy or indeed difficult, uh, having looked at that, you, you might find them to use. So if you've got any questions uh, about that recording, process and the tools that we're using there. Um, maybe just uh, on the Zencast, uh, the fact that they also record onto the guest's PC mm -hmm. um, and then upload. I do. Is there like, do the guests then need to like delete it on their PC specifically? Is that done automatically? It's done automatically. Okay. It's actually saved in the web browser cache. Okay. On the on the local hard disk. Okay. So all they need to do is uh, is at the beginning of the session. It's good to remind them that if possible, can they stay till the very end of the session um, when you actually end the recording um, for for that purpose. Uh, at the end of the day, sometimes um, we've had some sessions where people have had to go early or they've simply dropped out early, thinking that they weren't needed anymore. Uh, but we have in those cases been able to retrieve their audio from the cloud files. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. I, I was using uh, Zoom before, but this seems like a much better option, especially with the different channels for different um, speakers. So much better. It's, it's certainly well worth experimenting with. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially okay. the, as I say, because they have a free version. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's we found it to be a really, really useful tool. In fact, we we started doing podcasts shortly before lockdown. And we were doing them in our office. We would invite guests to our office where um, we bought quite a complicated multi-track recorder and mixer. And we'd have you know, different microphones set up and uh, it all looked like mission control. Um, <laughs> but uh, since, yeah, since, since we've all gone virtual, uh, that process has actually been much easier, much easier and you know, has needed much less really technical expertise. So, um, okay. yeah. Have you found it hard with people who don't have good mic setups? Like, or is it fine if they just literally have like one of these um, and, or is it a big problem? Um, no, the main problem that we might have is, is people being too close or too far away from uh -huh. the mic, or, okay. if they're, or if they're not using a headset, turning their head to speak. Uh, away from the mic and, and, then the, and then their voice suddenly goes quiet for a minute and stuff like that. So okay. if you can sort of, you know, give them some pointers on that sort of etiquette before, then generally that, that's not been the problem. Okay. Um, one thing about the recording locally and in the cloud is that very often during the sessions uh, in the cloud, because you're listening to cloud audio there, uh, somebody's audio might sound quite poor, but at the end of the recording, when they've uploaded their locally recorded file, it's actually fine and much better. Okay, that's cool, thanks. On, on that note, is there sort of any recommendations of what sort of platforms or cloud services are better for places that have lower bandwidth? Because for that, that's a chronic problem that we have here in Bangladesh is that we try using um, maybe Zoom recordings or so, but even just downloading the recordings with video 
and then any minor edits and then uploading them up oftentimes the bandwidth just keep dropping and then one video takes us a week to process just because right. it's so long to download it keeps dropping and then the next day you you realize that it hasn't actually done anything and you spend maybe two three days just trying to download a couple of days to edit and then another two three days figuring out how you can upload it whenever the bandwidth is good so are there any sort of cloud services that might be better place for um, loss in connectivity or so uh, unfortunately, I can't think of a positive answer to that. You are very much constrained by um, the quality and consistency of your bandwidth. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing about doing audio rather than video is that it takes much less bandwidth. Um, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I didn't even discuss the video options that uh, a lot of these programs include these days, because they can be yeah, pro prohibitively um, 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 you know, off-putting uh, and, and not work very well if you have a poor, poor connection. Mm -hmm. One thing with Zencaster is if one of your attendees drops off of the call because of a poor connection, if, if they rejoin the call while it's still going, then um, uh, the program recovers their audio so, so it works perfectly well, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they still just upload one audio track from their machine. Um, so, so it is quite good if, if somebody drops out and then can rejoin. But mm -hmm. there isn't any other um, bandwidth saving technology involved with this, uh, as I say, save the fact that we're using just audio instead of video as well. Apologies, I, I had to dash out to, to fix another issue with another session. Um, uh -huh. But um, so you may have covered this, David. But um, the, I know the Opera browser is particularly good for um, places with low bandwidth and so on. How does that work with Zencaster at all? Is there not at all? Right, that, that's what I thought. Yes, I, I thought that was going to be the case. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a very good point that you know there are better browsers than Chrome or edge or firefox or brave uh, but currently those are the only supported uh, browsers on this particular platform there are as i say other platforms which which will have slightly different requirements i'm not sure that they are actually significantly better but it might be worth investigating um the two those two main rivals to zencaster would be something called squadcast and something called ringer uh, and as i say the links to those will be in this presentation that i'll share with you after as well Thank you. Okay. So finally then, marketing and promotion, another absolutely key area of the whole process. Once you've uh, done your podcast, once you've completed your podcast, you really want the most people possible to, uh, to get hold of it. And so you'll need a subscription to a podcast hosting platform. Uh, IID uses SoundCloud. Uh, and their basic service is free. So you can host on there for free. And once you've uploaded to there, you can embed your podcast in your website uh, in a similar way to you would a YouTube video or something like that. So uh, as well as people hopefully discovering it on the SoundCloud site, you can also embed it and share it with other partner organizations or some such to, uh, to also embed it um, if that's possible. Uh, as I say, their basic service is free but they also offer uh, two further services. They offer a repost service, which distributes the track to other major platforms such as Spotify and Apple Music, Amazon Music, Instagram, and a few more. And they do that for only 30 US dollars a year. So it's probably worth signing up to that feature as well. They also have a pro service, which is about $144 a year, I think. Uh, but that includes things like performance analytics and some more um, advanced features. So uh, another key place to pop your uh, podcast is on YouTube. Strangely enough, because obviously it's not a video, but um, YouTube is free. Lots of people put their podcasts there and you can easily convert your podcast to a, um, a video by for example, uh, creating a PowerPoint presentation with a single slide and then adding your audio file to it and saving the presentation as a video, which you can do from within PowerPoint or indeed most similar presentation softwares. So then you have uh, uh, basically a card with details of your 
podcast showing while the audio plays on YouTube. And once again, it's very easy to share those YouTube links uh, in a number of ways or indeed embed them on your website. And that's completely free. So uh, your own website is a key place to put it. You don't want to only put it in uh, one of these hosted platforms. You want it on your own website if you have one and if possible on partner websites as well. So uh, sharing the embed code and um, asking politely if they might host it, if it's relevant to their work as well, is, uh, is always useful. Twitter, a key dissemination platform. Um, some of you might have joined the earlier session on Twitter uh, and how useful that is. And of course, Facebook uh, and other social media platforms uh, are key as well. Uh, yeah, as Matt's just pointed out, uh, that YouTube helps quite a lot with uh, SEO, search engine optimization. It's a good place to have your content. It's, it's very likely to to be discovered by search engines if you have it on there, especially if you pop a few keywords on. So it's uh, two minutes past one. I've come to the end of my slides and I do like this one with the puppies, so I've got it there again. So any more questions on uh, marketing or promotion or that aspect of it? I do have a question about the specifically the IIED one. Um, that you were just mentioning the one the, your regular one is that is that something that you are happy for other institutions that maybe have sort of like online hubs of some kind so if, for example the cst runs something called the resilience hub for southern africa and so we have a, a page on there with links to different podcast series um so is that like something that you're happy for us to pop yours on um or do we need like a special permission or something <laughs> No, that would be, that would be, yeah, no, we would very much appreciate that. So uh, Matt's just popped a, a link to right. our podcast in, in there. And, cool. and from there, yeah, you can, you can link to that page, which will always have the latest podcast and um, links to previous podcasts on it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, you may find that individual podcasts in that series are more relevant to a particular topic that you're looking at at any given time. So uh, once again, you can follow the links through to SoundCloud, the hosting platform, and um, copy the embed code for those and pop them on your site. Um, so, is there, yeah. Is there a reason you you chose SoundCloud over something like, like Spotify or Deezer or some of these other hosting platforms? One of the key reasons is initially it was free. We used a free account to start with. Uh, we, we've since found it so useful that we have uh, moved to the pro account. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. There are a number of sort of uh, competing market leaders. Um, we have the pro account with uh, Zencaster, which automatically pushes it to Spotify uh -huh. okay. uh, and Apple Music and Amazon right. Music and a few others as well. So we quite liked that feature. Um, I don't know, Matt, do you have any thoughts on uh, why we chose? Yeah, um, no, I mean, SoundCloud, look, looking around, you know, as, as we've been working on this for a while, um, you know, increasingly as you look at it, SoundCloud doesn't have a wonderful reputation. It's certainly mm -hmm. not bad, but, um, but I, I see lots of people questioning it. Um, and we've never really had a problem with it. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing, there's, there's no real aspects that we thought, oh, you know, I wish we could do this or why can't mm -hmm. we do that or that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, we're, we're pretty positive on SoundCloud, although I do recognise that elsewhere in the internet world, um, that's not always the case. Cool. No, that's good to know. I, 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 I must admit, I don't really know about this part, mm. of the, but I, I, I was just, I always thought SoundCloud was more for like personal, I don't know, like not so much for like organizational um, sort of professional po podcast, but I, what do I know? <laughs> so that was my question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So if, um, if, if there's no more questions or anything, I think we'll, we'll close the session there. Um, if anything else occurs to you, do please do get in touch. As I say, I'll share this uh, uh, um, presentation with you via email after this, uh, and you can follow all the links and see uh, the notes that accompany it, and it's got my email address on. So 
I hope it's been useful. Do you have one uh, more question? Sorry. Yes, please, 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 <laughs> please, please. I do. I was wondering if um, between Matt and you, David, maybe is there something like you're you've you've done this now for at least a year? Is there like what is like what is what, what is your one big lesson learned or um, takeaway? Do you have one? <laughs> Uh, now, if you ask different people in the podcast team, they might say different things. But <laughs> as, as the recording supervisor and audio editor, I would say the biggest lesson that we've learned is to manage the number of guests. Right. Um, because uh, as we say, you know, one, once the podcast in a sort of panel discussion format has four or five guests, then you have a lot of trouble uh, getting around every, you know, and everybody has to answer the same question. Mm -hmm. and there's three or four questions um it, it it makes for quite a dull listen as well mm -hmm. you know um if, if it was a seminar and you were there in person it would be a different thing but but um uh so so to try and think in terms of the medium rather than okay. just um putting a, a a presentation or a seminar up would be i think one of the biggest things and also managing the number of guests because that really does uh, disproportionately affect how long it takes to edit afterwards okay cool um I've, I've got a couple of things so what one one thing i'd say is that um you know i'd i'd ad always advise sort of david said you know you use it as the medium that in which it's intended um sometimes we don't do that um so for example one one of the things that you know every podcast every best practice podcast uh will advise is you know having a regular schedule mm -hmm. and and issuing you know so it's the second Thursday every month. OK, everyone knows it's 9 a.m. on the second Thursday every month. Um, the way we work, we don't tend to do that. Um, we might coincide our um, partly for the reasons that David's expressed and also because, you know, there might be an external event that we want to link it to uh, and push at that particular time. Right. Um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, you know, it, that seems at odds with what podcast people tell you to do basically right. um so whether we're following that perfectly or not is, is a is a question i'd ask also on the stats front so i'm i'm generally the person sort of going around finding the stats and that's a little more time consuming um than you might think um particularly depending on all the you know there, there is no one place that gathers all the analytics together yeah. so you can get that from soundcloud you have to go to spotify to get that right. amazon to get that and and you know soon it's just you know it's just annoying yeah. Um, try, trying to get all the individual stats for each episode and, and combine it all together. Um, right. So that I find that annoying, but that's just a personal peeve. <laughs> it is amazing that there isn't like a, a service that can just kind of collate it all. It's, mm. I've heard this a number of times. It's bizarre. Okay. And it's partly because obviously they're all in competition with each sure. other. They, they want you to use their service and sure. you know, their hosting network, you know. So, right. Right. yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks for those. Yeah, uh, insights. <laughs>